Well, good morning. Great to see everybody today, and happy Mother's Day. Hey, before we move on, I want to just mention, you know, I know that for some of us, what, what just happened might have happened too quickly. You know, some moms were standing, and we said, yeah, go ahead, and if you have a gift card or some money, just go and give. And then the moment ended before you even realized it. No, it's okay. And I know that there were a few moms that you stood, and no one made their way to you. And, and I know, some of us were caught by surprise, and we're wondering, what's going on here? And it's really it, it, for you to do this, for you to be blessed. And if you saw a mom standing near you, and you didn't quite make it happen in that moment, just sometime over the next hour, before, before everybody leaves, God, really, like, just see what it's like to allow a blessing to flow through you. Uh, because I, I don't want, especially, and if you are a mom and, and you stood and nothing g- happened because we didn't quite make it your way, come out to the blue tables afterwards. We're going to make sure you leave blessed today. We want that for you. Okay, so Rivers Part 4. All right, we're diving in. And uh, I'm going to start this way. So uh, a couple months ago, Ann and I had a chance to go on a, a trip that we had been hoping to do for a long time, which was a trip to Costa Rica. And uh, we stayed up in Guanacaste by the by the coast at a beach hotel there, and I'm an early riser, so by the second or third day, I kind of got into what I was going to do, which was get out of bed and go get some coffee, and she could sleep, and, and so I, I got up early, got my coffee, and I, I was uh, walking down the beach on this path right near the beach, and I was, uh, I was surprised with this little scene that unfolded right before me, just like right there by the side of the beach in the morning. I'm just walking with my coffee, and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is Nat Geo right here. I'm in it. Like, here we go. And that was, that, that was my phone. I'm like, this is crazy. And I saw him just munching, eating his little breakfast. And then I looked further up the path, and I noticed that, that these guys are not just cute. They're like fiends. Like, they're fiends. Like, they know the deal. They know that that all of us tourists are going to come by like a river and they're going to get our stuff. They're going to get our breakfast. And so what happens is all the tourists know, hey, hit the buffet, load up on the grapes and pineapples because these guys, they're going to get them. And and, and they're they're crazy. They're cute, but they are not afraid of getting close. Like this guy, he's like, I'll take your hat, dude. I'll I'll get the hat and the grape. (laughs) It's not either or. Give it. Give it. Go. It's just so amazing. For me, this was like a dream come true, because I mean, I grew up on Curious George, you know, man in the yellow hat, except my hat is blue, but th- this dude's my buddy. Anyway, I, I literally had like the, the, that made the whole trip for me, just the experience with all the monkeys, and, and while I was there, uh, each day, kind of going out with grapes from the breakfast buffet, I was thinking about those monkeys and how good they have it. Like, all they need to do is plant themselves right there. And as long as they just plant themselves right there, there's just going to be this river of tourists that's going to come through day after day with grapes and pineapples. And, and, and it's an amazing life for them, nice life for the monkeys. And uh, maybe in a sense today, I want to just say to you, maybe take a cue from them. <laughs> and, and, and you'll understand why by the end of the message. But, but I, I do believe that where you're planted is going to affect what you receive. And there's a picture in the scriptures that I'm going to take you to that is a a prophetic and symbolic picture of a way to live where you are able to receive what you need. And there's a word that we use to describe that, and it comes through in the Bible uh, as the word blessed or blessed. Everybody say blessed. Okay, so I'm going to ask you right now to open up the Bible to Psalm 1. And yes, even though it's Mother's Day, I'm hoping a few of you brought your Bible. At least you got a Bible app on your phone, okay? So uh, Psalm chapter 1, and we're, as we're getting there, I'm going to read just from the King James first, and I want you to hear what it says. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Why don't you read it one time with me from the beginning? Psalm 1, King James Version, verse 1. Go. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Okay, so big picture. What, what happens here in the Word of God is, is there's, this, uh, there's this king, this leader of Israel. His name is David. And he's got a job to do. He's got to lead the whole entire nation of God's people. He's the king. He's, he's in charge of whatever's going to happen. But he also is a man of faith. And he writes his devotions and these poems and these songs of praise to God. And and they are a reflection of what a a real man or woman who has a real and vibrant life of faith can experience. And, And he chooses this word, blessed, 
Everybody say blessed. blessed. And th- there is something about this word that I think most of us gravitate towards. Even if we don't know the exact definition of it, we, we know that it's something good and we desire it. And if I were to just start the message today this way, and if I were to say, hey, does anyone want to experience uh, favor, joy, positive goodness, contentment, and even happiness? Show of hands, show of hands. Most of us would say, yeah, of course. Well, that's what blessed is. Except when we talk about it from a, a biblical, spiritual perspective, it is all of that, but its origin is in God. So, so let me dis, dis, uh, define this one more time for you, what blessed is. It is to be experiencing joy, favor, positive goodness, contentment, and even happiness that has its origin in God. That's what it means to be blessed. Show of hands, who wants to be blessed? I hope you want to be blessed. Because the Bible in Psalm 1 starts out with that word, blessed is the man, blessed is the person. And then it describes a series of things. And if you, if you read it out loud and you remember what it said, blessed is the man who uh, it does not stand in the way of sinners or sit with the mockers or walk in the way of the wicked. Did you catch all that? And what we're being given an indication of is that if we want to live a blessed life, there is a correlation between the choices we make about where we're going to go and the direction we're going to point our lives and the degree to which we experience blessing. Your desire to live a blessed life is good. That comes from the goodness of God inside of you, whether you know him or not. But the choices you make are going to have a bearing on the degree to which and the characteristic of which you experience blessing. I want you to be blessed. And I want you to understand how that blessing comes. And it comes through, first of all, you understanding who you are and being thoughtful about what path you go on and where you plant yourself. Ah, where you plant yourself. We gotta, we got to talk about this a little bit more, but to do that, I want to take you uh, to the whole entire psalm. So I'm going to take you to Psalm 1, this time in the New Living Translation. So if you want to switch your translation or at least open it up, this is what it says. It says, oh, the joys of those. Another way to express blessing. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their, lives will, their leaves will never wither. They prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They're like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They'll be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Okay, so King David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, praying, seeking God, starts writing these verses, inspired by the Spirit, for you and me to catch a vision of how to live. And it's like as though in this moment, Holy Spirit through David is saying, look at the big picture. If you look at the big picture, there's kind of two ways to go. You could go godly or you could go wicked. And at any given moment, you're gonna. You're gonna go godly or you're gonna go wicked. When you go godly, you get peace. You get the the sense of purpose flowing through you. When you go wicked, you get destruction. And, And so I know we don't think about this all the time, but I think today we need to, to think about what path am I on? Am I moving in a path that's towards godliness? Where am I planting myself? Am I planting myself in in a way in which I can experience life as God has intended it? Where I'm like a tree planted by the riverbank. And the tree's leaves are not withering. And it's prospering in all it does. Because that's the picture of what God has for you and me. And I hope you take it to heart. I hope you'll take it to heart and consider how it is that you're going to get to that place where you are living a, a godly life. Okay, so when you were young... Your mom, hopefully most of us anyway, your mom would literally put, pick you up and put you on the path where she wanted you to be, the right path for your life. When you were a, a child, your mom would point you uh, on the direction that was right for you and that you should go and that would be well with you if you would do what she would say. But you reach a certain age where it doesn't work that way anymore. 
You reach a certain age where it becomes your responsibility to decide, where am I going to plant myself? And you look around and you go, am I planted by, by people who are leading me towards things that are good? Am I planted around a community of people that are pointing me towards what's godly and powerful from God? Or am I planting myself out in the desert uh, around influences that are causing me to deteriorate? Are, are you tracking with me? Because I believe God wants to catch somebody's attention today and to catch your attention and to say, there's a better life for you. Yeah, I didn't want for you to be planted out there by the desert, scratching in the hopelessness and in the shadows and in the dryness, falling apart, disintegrating. That's not what I wanted for you. I wanted you right here, planted by the riverbank. I got to take you back to those words one more time. Psalm 1, the first three verses. I just got to get this into the air and into your heart for a second. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, it said, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers. But... The delight. Would you read verse 2 out loud with me? Ready? Go. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They, they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Now, I wonder if I would have said today, Anybody here, are you interested in, in discovering how you can prosper? <laughs> Probably most of us would be honest, I hope, and say, yeah, I, of course. Well, well, God's saying, right, that desire that you have is a good desire, and I want that for you too. And this is how it happens. You plant yourself along the riverbank, and then my goodness flows your way. And the river we're talking about, I'm going to take you there by the end of this message, is the river of God. This is metaphorical language that we're reading in Psalm 1. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit as a prophetic metaphor, but you can see even how in the metaphor it turns from a tree to a person who prospers. But it's about you being the kind of individual who's soaking up all of the goodness that you need, and because you're soaking up all of the goodness, the good stuff is flowing through and coming through your life. I believe that God has a, an intended purpose for you, an intended destiny for you. And the way that that's going to be empowered to take place is through you being like a tree planted by the riverbank. And, and there's a characteristic that's described of people who are planted by a riverbank. And, and I want to make sure that you, you can catch this and you can, and you can see this. It, it, it is... It, it is for you to be like a tree. There's a brother in our church sent me a picture of, of a tree. And this particular tree is in South Carolina. He sent me a picture of it. It's 900 years old. Oh, you got to zoom out a little bit so you can see. You, you, well, there it is. You can kind of see Eric. He's standing there. See how tiny Eric is and how massive that tree is? 900 years old. But do you notice what's in the background? The river. Only reason why that tree has lasted 900 years and it's still green and going is because it, there you go, it is planted by the river, 900 years. I just want you to capture that image in your mind for a second and recognize that's kind of a picture of what God envisions for you, that you wouldn't be scratching in the desert with despair and disintegration, but you would be like that, like right there where the source of everything you need is just consistently flowing your way and flowing into you. And because of that, the good things are growing in your life. I think God wants that for you, and, and there's a way to get there. Verse 2, one more time, it said about people who live that way, it said, they delight in the law of the Lord. Say, delight in the law of the Lord. Delight in the law of the Lord. Delight in the law of the Lord. When we talk about the law of the Lord, we're really talking about the eternal truth that comes from the heart of God. And people who are like that tree... They are planted right there where we're delighting in what God says and how God orders things and what God is doing. That flows into their mind, body, soul, and spirit and comes through their life. And it's available to every single one of us to, to delight in the law of the Lord. So here's what I'm going to do. For the next 10 minutes, I just want to break down what does it mean to delight in the law of the Lord. And I believe that if you would, if you would understand this, you're going to see three keys to lasting spiritual vitality. 
This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just for today. <laughs> but I want you to catch what it really means to delight in the law of the Lord, because I know that that's the characteristics that's going to lead to you living in a life that's marked by prospering. So delighting in the law of the Lord, what does it mean? What does it look like? Well, the first thing that it looks like is it looks like you, you take stock of who you are and you recognize, I am a child of God. And that means something to me. That means I have a heavenly father and I'm going to learn to orient my life around his ways. I am going to do things that are in keeping with what my heavenly father is like. And so I, that's who I am. So verse one talked about sitting in the seat of the, of the mocker, talked about standing around with sinners. It, it talked about, uh, about walking in the way of wicked. And I'm going to look at that and I'm going to not gloss over that. I'm talking to somebody today. Truth is, things have gotten messed up in your life. And you know why? Because you've been walking on the path of the wicked. It goes somewhere. It's not pretty. For someone else, you know, you've been thinking, man, things have gotten messed up in my life. Why? Well, because you, you, you've allowed yourself to stand around with sinners. And when you stand around with sinners, you're going to be doing what sinners do. And, and if you're a Christian, here's the truth. You were a sinner but your sin was forgiven and you were made brand new and that's no longer your identity. You're no longer a sinner. You are a victorious Christian who struggles against sin and you more and more live into what's right. But, but for someone else, you know, things have gotten kind of sour somehow in your life and, and the truth is it's because you've gotten into a place where you're, you're sitting in the seat of the mocker. The, the mocker, the one who's just operating in cynicism about everything, which is the enemy of faith. And so for somebody, I'm telling you today, verse one is for you. You got to go, come to attention. That's not who I am. What am I doing over there? And get up, move. Take the vision of that tree planted by the river and decide that's who I really am. And in an instant, you can make a quantum jump into the place that God wants you to be planted by the river, the river of God flowing your way. So what does it look like to delight in the law of the Lord? Number one, you are a person who will take in the word of God. Take in the word of God. Three keys to spiritual, lasting spiritual vitality. Take in the word of God. Say it out loud with me. Take in the word of God. I am imploring you to be somebody who would daily take in the word of God. Daily. And, and not just a Verse of the day, one hit wonder. I'm talking about take in the word of God. Earlier this week, I had a, a, a guy reach out to me and it was a, an SOS call, it was a message of, hey, everything's falling apart in our lives. We're about to lose everything. Uh, it, it, we're, it's all falling apart. Um, we're, I don't even know how we're going to make it. This is, you know, desperate. Pray for us. And, and instantly, I felt like a fire inside of me. And my answer came back very quickly. And I simply just began to speak to him and said, and, and said listen, you, I want you to hear the word of God. Psalm 18, 29 says, with my God, I can crush any army. And with my God, I can scale any wall. What I was trying to say is, bro, take heart from the word of God. What seems impossible, you can face it. You have access to a source of power for overcoming and victory. It's yours. And I said, brother, one more thing I got to lay down on you. Isaiah 43, 2. God says, yep, when the waters rise, I will be with you in the waters. And when the flood currents come, you will not be drowned. That's what it says. So believe for what God can do. So do you see what I'm saying? Like, there was a need, there was a moment, and what began to happen inside of me was a fire, but it was a fire of words of God. Where does that come from? That comes from me being like a lot of you. I just, every day, I take in the word of God. I let it marinate inside of me because I need it. Those two things that I shared with him, I needed them two days before. Right? And so that's how it works. You take in the Word of God, and, and when you bring out the Word of God, it has eternal power. It comes from the very heart of God, and it carries the power of God's heart for people in situations with it. You, you need the Word of God. Jesus said in, in Mark ch chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus said, Ma Matthew 4, 4, sorry. He said, man doesn't live by bread alone. People don't need just the material stuff. He said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You're actually designed to be fed like that tree is fed from the stream flowing to it. You're designed to be fed in your spirit through the eternal power of the truth of God's word. Take it in. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 35, he said, everything you see, heaven and earth, are going to pass away, but the words of God are going to remain forever. 
Jesus said that. And it's Jesus giving us a little window into a reality, which is that there's more that your soul needs than just making some money and, and, and doing a little bit so you have something to eat. You, you are made to be fed on the inside by the Word of God. Now, let me ask you something. If I were to ask you, what is your daily dental care routine? You'd probably be able to answer me, be like, Psh, well, dude, I, I brush my teeth every morning and every night, and I, I floss like at least a couple times a week, you know, I'm a dental hygienist would be proud of me. And you, you, you would talk about, I do some mouthwash. I, I know Eric Buss in our church makes this special toothpaste called David's Toothpaste in Menopee. It's made here in Menopee. This stuff's amazing. I use that because it's the best out there. You know, you, you, would ta- you would have an answer. If I said, well, what about your hair? You know, you'd say, oh, yeah, well, I take a shower every day. I use this shampoo, a conditioner. I get out a, a towel dry it, then I blow dry it, and I put some stuff on it and style it, and okay, what about, what about your food? And you would describe, I go shopping, I go to Hit Winco for this, and Trader Joe's for that, and I stock up, and I'm, you, right? And you wouldn't even bat an eye, you would answer me, because you recognize, oh, I gotta take care of this. But I'm telling you, what about your spirit within you? What is your, what is your care routine for your spirit within you? Do you know how much it matters for you to have a life that really is marked by prospering? It must be centered on a receiving of the goodness and grace of God. And the source, bar none of that, is the Word of God. So I hope that I could ask any of you, if I bumped into you in the street, what is your spiritual care routine? And I pray to God, each one of you would say, well, listen. Here's what I do. I open up my Bible every day. And I don't have an hour like you, Pastor. Ha! But I, I, I got 10 minutes. I got 15 minutes. Or I'm at least listening to it on slow speed while I'm driving, right? Like something. Tell me you got a spiritual care routine for your soul where you're taking in the Word of God. Because it will feed you. It will nourish you. It will strengthen you. And you and I need to recognize something. What's happening right now in the world around us is the most incredible degree of distraction that I think humanity's ever been confronted with. And I think it's actually something, at least to some degree, empowered or utilized by the forces of darkness to get us off our game. I remember a time 25 years ago, nobody had all this digital distraction, and so it would be normal to say, of course I'm gonna open up a Bible and read that. Now, I don't know, I'm worried about us. And I'm just pleading with you, be a person who desires to be like a tree planted by the river that's leaves are not withering, it's producing the fruit in every season, and it's prospering, and you know that's a metaphorical picture of your life planted by the river of God, and you take in the Word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Take in the Word of God. Okay, so you, you are gaining right now keys to spiritual vitality. And the first is that you're going to be picturing yourself like that tree planted by the river, and I take in the Word of God. But you know what? What comes next is your move. What are you going to do with the Word of God? Are you going to actually follow what it says? And what comes next, the question will always be there. Will you move in the will of God? Will you move in the will of God? Move in the will of God. You want a key to spiritual vitality? Boom. Move in the will of God. Say it with me. Move in the will of God. Our God, majestic, beautiful, mighty, powerful God, creator of the heavens and the earth, creator of hundreds of billions of galaxies and planets and solar systems, uh, also created you individually with free moral agency, meaning you actually get to make real choices, real time. You're not a puppet. You're not a programmed uh, robot. God is majestic. When you really think about it, even if you just look around this one room and go, man, artificial intelligence is nothing. Look what God did, creating all of these beings, each one with a will and agency and ability to make choices. And you do have an ability to make choices. And God's looking at you and saying, would you move in my will? You've spent time over here moving in the will of your flesh, just doing whatever you wanted to. And it's kind of landed you in some places that didn't you do you do good. You ended up over here scratching along in the desert, hurting, ashamed, embarrassed, in pain. That's not what I wanted for you. How about the river? How about the river? How about planted by the riverbank? And, and, and you get to move in the will of God. You get to exercise your will. Here, here's what I would ask you to consider. I think maybe for some of us, we, we need to develop a greater sense of consciousness about the will that we have. 
Rather than just going on autopilot and going with the flow of whatever, beginning to be mature about who we are and say, no, I actually have a choice to make. And I'm making a choice right now. Like, they begin to just think that way in your life. I'm making a choice right now. I'm exercising will right now. Is the way I'm exercising my will, am I moving in the will of God or am I just moving in the will of the world around me and the will of the flesh because they go different places? And I believe that God wants you and I to learn to move in His will. Move in the will of God. Say it again. Move in the will of God. Move in the will of God. This is who we are made to be. People who move in the will of God. The third thing we want to do is, is we want to be people who walk in the ways of God. Everybody say, walk in the ways of God. My son was telling me about something I had no idea about because I guess I'm old and dinosaur status now. But he said, uh, have you ever heard of like Twitch streaming and kick streaming and he named a bunch of things and I, I don't, just don't know about that stuff. And, and he was describing it. He was saying it started out just people just kind of being funny and all of us in our generation just like watch that and get swept into watching somebody play Valorant or whatever all day long in video games. But then recently kind of made it a little bit of a switch and, and some online gambling companies started paying some of these Twitch and kick streamers hey, we'll give you a million bucks. You just uh, do a stream of you spending hours just gambling. And then people started watching that. And before you know it, tens of thousands of young adults just getting lost, lost, lost into a, an addiction in, in online gambling, just like that. And, and it's a problem when God ha has a, a vision of prospering, but there's this force at work in the world. And that's just one little element of it that is literally hell-bent on your destruction. And, and the question remains, will you move in the will of God and will you learn to walk in the ways of God? Because there's a difference. There's a difference. Walk in the ways of God. And, and how this happens is you, you learn to move in the will of God by discerning what's actually happening. Here's what I mean. You, you have to begin to recognize I'm being affected by an influence. Just learn to develop that consciousness. I'm being affected by an influence. Don't just accept it. Let your will be activated to make a choice. Do I want to move in that direction or not? Is it healthy? Does it lead to the vision of vibrancy, like a tree planted by a river that God has for me? If not, then why would I want to go there? Here's what I really want to do. The scripture says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, do not conform any longer to the algorithms of this world. And if I were making the translation today, that's exactly how I would translate it. Do not conform any longer to the algorithms of this world. Of course, there's, there's patterns of this world, but you and I know what's going on. Do not conform any longer to the algorithms of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How's your mind get made new? By taking in the word of God and learning to then use your will actively and intentionally to move in the will of God. Do not be conformed any longer to the algorithms of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then it says, you will be able to test and approve, this is Romans 12 too, what God's will is. His perfect, perfect, pleasing will. While we're talking about moving in the will of God, can I just lay this down for you? There is a broad expanse of what is available in the will of God. And part of what's in the will of God would be called the permissible will of God, where God as a father is saying, well, you know, if that's what you want... <laughs> But there's a sweet spot. The perfect, pleasing will of God is better than just what's permissible. It's better. It leads to better in your life. And you get to learn to move in that, in the will of God. But it will require you to develop a consciousness about what's affecting you and decide to break out of it. And then you walk in the ways of God. Say that one. Walk in the ways of God. So we're talking about what does it mean to delight in the law of the Lord? At first, it's a, I take in the word of God, and then I move in the will of God, and now I walk in the ways of God. Walk in the ways of God. I'll put it like this. When my kids were little, I, I would uh, tell them what to do. I would tell them exactly what they can and can't do. And that was my will. And I expected them to do my will. I was glad when they did. But now that they're, the two of them anyway are young adults, I don't want them to do my will anymore. I don't want to be standing around telling a 21-year-old, well, now you need to do this, and then you need to do that. No, I mean, anybody who's a mom or a dad, can you relate? Like, you, you, you reach a point where you don't want them doing your will anymore. What you want for them is that they would, if I could put it like this, that they would walk in your ways. 
Like, take the character and the values that you, you would want for them and live those out, right? And I believe our Heavenly Father wants the very same thing. He wants for you to grow in your maturity in the Spirit to the degree that you would walk in God's ways. It's like this. The other day, uh, you know, my, one of my sons was talking to me, and, and he's, he's a young adult, but then he, he's sharing about how, you know, he had started this business and how this business is growing, and it's a real business with business licenses and everything, and actually tens of thousands of dollars coming through, and, and I'm amazed when I hear about this. And, and, and I hear about him saying, I was knocking door to door until I found another business that I could do a partnership deal with, and I'm just sitting there smiling from ear to ear listening to all of this. Why? Because my son is not doing my will, but he's definitely walking in my ways. Like, th those are my ways. Like, I, when he was young, this is what we do. This is our, what our values are as a family. We make stuff happen. We take initiative on things. We take a risk on things. We exercise that grit and see what can happen out there. And to hear about him doing that, dude, I know. He's walking in my ways. I couldn't be happier. I mean, there are some things about it that I would maybe wish would be a little different. But, hey, that's what growing up <laughs> gives the opportunity for I want him to walk in my ways, and I believe God wants you to grow in your spiritual maturity where it's not about uh, him having to dictate every little thing, but instead you, you have a spiritual maturity about you because you're planted by the riverbank, and it's flowing, and as a result, you're more and more walking in the ways of God, reflecting his character and his values through your identity grounded and rooted in him. Walk in the ways of God. Okay, putting it all together in one prophetic uh, declaration, I would say it like this. I take in the word of God, I move in the will of God, and I walk in the ways of God. I want you to just say this out loud one time as a declaration over your own life. Just say it with me. Ready, go. I take in the word of God, I move in the will of God, and I walk in the ways of God. Just say it one more time. I take in the word of God. I move in the will of God, and I walk in the ways of God. Because that is me being like a tree planted by the riverbank. And it's a river flowing that's a river of the love of God. So this is a metaphorical language that's used in Psalm 1. But then you fast forward to the end of the book, and what you see in Revelation is that is that the, the, the river really does come from the very heart and throne of God. In, in Revelation 22, this is what it says. It says, then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street, and on each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month, and the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. I mean, the, the language goes from metaphorical to metaphysical. And then I read in Ephesians 2, 6, that you and me, we're here, but we're also, if we're in, in Jesus, we're, we're seated with him in heavenly places. That that's an actual truth. But there's so much distraction that you're numb to that reality. And we're sitting over here messing around with distractions when all of, all of, a, all of a sudden the reality is that there's a, I keep using this phrase, but a, a quantum jump that's possible for you to be exercising who you are as seated in heavenly places. Heavenly places by that river. The river coming from the throne of God. And do you know what the scripture says about God? It says that he is love. So you can expect that what flows from his throne would be love. A whole lot of it in every way that it's needed in your life. <laughs> and in Ephesians, uh, what we read in Ephesians chapter, chapter 3 is this. There's a prayer that says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That's a prayer that I hope somebody hears today, that God wants that for you, to be so complete that the brokenness is mended and you're, you're whole and you're complete and you're complete and full on the life and power, the love and life and power that come from God. So I want to pray today that for some of us, we, we, we could reset. Here's the deal. Some of us are, we're here and we have been believers, but somehow we got transplanted out into the desert and we're scratching in the dry deterioration and going, what happened to me? And I'm telling you, today is a day of return for somebody. Yeah. Really, it's a day of return for somebody. To, to return to the place where you are, again, 
like a tree planted by the river. And the river is the river of God flowing to you. And, and you're taking in, you're determined to shift today, to be a person who will take in God's word, move in God's will, and walk in God's ways. That will lead to spiritual vitality. Oh. So those, those monkeys, right? Actually, I can't. This, I'm just old enough to start wanting to sing, hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and I can't get it out of my head. Now it's not going to be in, in, out of your head, too. Okay, so those monkeys, yeah, they planted themselves on that pathway by the beach, and all this river of tourists would always come their way with grapes and pineapples. But at the same time, as they were blessed in that way, I'm sure those monkeys also faced hardships. Like some days the storms would come, and then the tourists aren't walking along with their grapes anymore. Or some days in little monkeyville, one monkey starts fighting against another monkey and hurting each other. That, I'm sure that happens too. And in some days, uh, the, the, the monkeys are, are messing around, and maybe there's some, some spider or something that bites one of them. Like, I'm just trying to say, like, I made the, the analogy that those monkeys were blessed, right? But I don't want us to think that blessed means that there aren't challenges. That would be a mistake. To, to, to anticipate living a blessed life has to include that, yes, I am planted in such a way that I can receive all that I need so that I can actually face and deal with the hard things and the challenges that are going to come my way. The storms, the spiders, the whatever. And we get what we need from God. So I'm just making this a prophetic declaration over you that you are like a tree planted by the riverbank. And your leaves never wither. And you produce all the fruit intended in every season. And you prosper. I'm praying for that for you. And I'm praying that you would decide, yes and amen, that's who I am. Yeah, so let's take a moment and pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for a simple picture in Psalm 1. A picture of flourishing. A picture like that, that, that we can understand. And I pray, God, for some of us that you would do a transforming work in our lives. Where some of us, we, we really have gotten way off course. And we, we've been doing exactly what verse 1 said. We've been walking in the ways of the wicked. We've been sitting in the seat of the scorners. And, and we've been standing around with sinners. We've been doing all that. Oh, God, forgive us. I just pray, God, for some of us where that's where we've been, forgive us. And I pray, Lord, for some of us who are there right now, where our hearts are hardened, God, I pray that you would soften our hearts to be able to acknowledge that that is not going anywhere good, and I need off of that path. And, and if that's you today, and you'd go, man, I do need off of that path. I, I can see where it's going, and it's kind of not getting better. Jesus is the rescuer, and today he's able to really rescue and deliver you and to take you to exactly where he wants you to be, like a tree planted by the river, leaves not withering, fruit bearing in every season, prospering in all you do. It, it, there needs to be a moment, though, where you would say, Jesus, would you forgive me and save me? He, he, he's he awaiting you, turning to him. And if you would do it today, turn to him and say, Jesus, would you forgive me and save me? He will forgive your sin and save your life and give you his gift of salvation. He's awaiting the opportunity to give you his gift, but he will not force it on you. It's offered to you today. And today, for somebody, this is the day to finally receive what Jesus offers, a gift of salvation. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do an awakening even right now for some of us, that we would wake up to the reality that we are on a pathway that's leading to deeper wickedness, and it's bad. And I pray, God, that you would cause some of us to wake up and say, I don't want to be on this anymore. I want the forgiveness and the peace and the healthy, flourishing life that Jesus can give. And, and God, I pray that you would allow that spiritual awakening to happen right now. And somebody would once and for all say, Jesus, I give you my life. While we're praying together, if you're sitting here saying, I need to do that, 
I need to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. Right now, I want you to raise your hand really high. It's just a moment in time where you can say once and for all, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. Raise your hand right now with me as a, a moment in time of you saying, I want Jesus. I want to ask for his gift of forgiveness of my sins. And I just see a couple of you right now. And if I'm missing you, God doesn't miss a thing. And over in the back of my right, I see both of you and whoever else. I just don't want, to make, don't want to rush too quickly through this moment. If you're here and you need to get right with God and ask Jesus to forgive your sins and save you, I want you to do it. Raise your hand with me. In the, uh, right in the middle over here, that's awesome. And anyone else in, in the middle of my left? Just take a moment right now with your hand raised, you pray with me, and you say, Jesus Christ, I turn to you. I repent of my sin and I turn to you. Just tell him, Jesus, I repent of my sin and I turn to you. And I'm asking Jesus that you would forgive my sin and save my life. Just say it to him, Jesus, would you forgive my sin and save my life? And then just tell him, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Just say it with me, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you're the Savior. Save me. Save me, Jesus. Just tell him, I want to be like that tree planted by the river, your river. And so I give you my life, and I'm yours from this moment on. Jesus, I'm yours. And we all together say amen. Amen. I want you to stand up, church. Stand up, and let's take a moment and just say, God, you have been good to me and I'm trusting in your promises over my life. Would you just say, God, you've been good to me. Just say it one more time. God, you've been good to me. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for what you said. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you are blessed by today's message. If you would like to get connected, join the Centerpoint community or give, please visit us at mycenterpoint.tv. Please click subscribe, and we hope to see you again real soon.